Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Vicki Janowski, editor of the Greater Wilmington Business Journal and Wilma Magazine. Welcome to this week's Wilmington Biz Talk. And today we're going to be talking about the latest on the COVID-19 cases in the area and the status of testing and quarantining um, with Dr. Paul Kamitska with Wilmington Health and also Carla Turner with the County um, Health Department. Um, also, after our discussion on what's going on latest on the health front, we're going to be joined by uh, author Audrey Goodson Kingo and talk a little bit about how parents are coping right now, particularly with going back to, in a lot of people's cases, working from home with children. So for either of those discussions, be sure to uh, leave any questions you might have on either topic if you're watching from our business journal or our Wilma web pages. And we'll start in just a minute. But first, we're going to hear a quick word from our sponsors, Cape Fear Realtors. Hello, I'm Ann Gardner, CEO of Cape Fear Realtors. Realtors support this program's efforts to connect our community in meaningful dialogue with actionable insights. Realtors are dedicated professionals who build strong, resilient communities and businesses. Work with someone you can trust. Work with a realtor. Learn more at capefear.realtor. Well, it's likely uh, right now you either know someone who uh, is sick with COVID, you have symptoms yourself, you work with someone, you have children home from school, or you are just monitoring the situation. The, um, uh, the Omicron variant has been proven to be just as contagious as we've seen in other parts of the country, and we've seen the impacts here in the Cape Fear region. Uh, so joining us now, we thought this was the perfect time to check in with some of our local health officials. Uh, we have Dr. Kamitska with Wilmington Health, our infectious disease physician, who we've talked to throughout the different phases of the past two years of the pandemic, and also Carla Turner with the, the County Health Department, who can fill us in a little bit about what they're seeing and what they're seeing in the schools as well. So just to kick us off, and also a reminder, if you want to um, stay tuned as well later, we're going to have a separate discussion about parenting at working at home uh, as children are also being being impacted by the virus and being sent home as well. Um, we're going to have a, a discussion of that at around 12.15 if you want to, to stay on for that as well. But first, let's get a look at what the snapshot is here locally with Dr. Kamitska. What are you seeing in terms of uh, the cases and numbers now? So I think uh, the best way to characterize our current situation in this area is that we are having widespread uh, uh, Omicron. Uh, and the numbers of hospitalized patients keeps going up every day. Uh, as of right now, we have 105 uh, patients at New Hanover. That rivals the peak that we've ever seen uh, in the past. And I think one of the things that's really important to emphasize, and I think the public doesn't quite uh, realize just how contagious this variant is. Uh, and a standard cloth mask is almost uh, useless. It's only about 30% protective. A surgical mask may be 50% protective, but really with this variant, you need to have either an N95 mask or a KN95 mask. Now, I know uh, it may be difficult to find ones and there are some counterfeits out there. Uh, wow. If you just go to like Amazon to try to, to, to find it. There is one website, uh, it's a reputable one. It's a, a N95 project.org and you can order N95 masks through that. Uh, and my understanding is also the government is gonna be distributing some uh, N95 uh, masks. But in order for you to protect yourself in any indoor environment, so if you go to the grocery store or any other indoor environment, you really should be wearing a uh, very good mask like an N95 or a KN95 uh, to protect yourself from getting infected. Uh, now, for those who are vaccinated, and especially those who are boosted, if you get infected, uh, the likelihood of severe illness is vastly uh, reduced. Uh, but I would remind those who have been vaccinated a while ago, who have yet to get their boosters, to be boosted. Uh, because then, uh, chances are, if you catch COVID, uh, you'll be, have a very minor illness. Uh, and that's uh, pretty much what we're seeing. The, the folks that are sick enough to be hospitalized, uh, and we've already had uh, 25 deaths uh, as of yesterday since January 1st. Uh, it's predominantly those who have not been vaccinated. 
So for everybody, and particularly those who've not been vaccinated, wearing uh, a proper N95 or KN95 mask to protect yourself uh, is going to be crucially important. And Carla, over at the health department, and we should point out, um, Carla Turner is the assistant health director for New Hanover County. So from New Hanover County's perspective, what are you guys seeing in terms of where we are right now? Um, kind of along the lines of what Dr. Kamitska is saying, our, our numbers uh, continue to increase. Um, we are pulling positive cases off the state website throughout the day, all day long. Um, we are continuing to encourage, like Dr. Kamitska was saying, vaccination. And if you've had your initial series of doses to get your booster, um, there are places throughout the community where you can get those. We are continuing to provide that at, our, at the mall site, um, Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays. And we offer it every day here at our HHS building. So um, we are seeing that the numbers are still going up. Um, just and based on what you know what we're hearing we we have a lot of people who are having trouble finding testing and i don't think that's that's not just unique to us um so we're working to help people you know find testing we are working we got 43,000 in 95 masks in from the government that we are working to distribute um equitably um so that's kind of where we are our numbers i i, I can say with confidence that our numbers are still increasing for the county supply then of the N95 masks, you guys have a plan then to announce how you're going to distribute those out or where, what are you going to plan to do? We that? have, we have, uh, yes, we have been working with our community partners to get those masks out to some of our historically marginalized communities. We are making them available also to employees. Um, but yes, we do have a plan in place and we can certainly uh, share that with you after this. And then just on the number side, so we just mentioned that was what New Hanover County is seeing. Brunswick County's health um, officials just reported to the commissioners there um, earlier this week. You know, the percent of positive tests, people who are testing and, and the positives are coming back has increased to 32.5% as of this week. Uh, what the state goal has, has been that that particular figure, that particular metric be down at 5%. And I feel like it wasn't so long ago when New Hanover County um, was around or below 5% as well for um, for that rate. Um, that was before the holidays. Um, Omicron was already circulating before the holidays. This was certainly no surprise that it was going to, to go up after the holidays and with this particularly more contagious variant. Um, but is, for either of you, is there anything though that has surprised you with seeing how it has spread uh, through the community or in terms of, of the demographics maybe that it's mostly uh, impacting? No, uh, you know, I think, uh, I guess what surprises me most is that uh, is the number of people I see in grocery stores and other indoor environments who don't have masks. Uh, it's, uh, it really is uh, close to insanity not to mask given how contagious this virus is. And if you mask, and if you have an N95 or can 95 it provides very good protection. I mean, that's how we protect ourselves when we treat COVID patients in the hospital. And so all that all it takes is for people to do that, and uh, you know you avoid uh, having to be so concerned about uh, contracting COVID. Uh, and so uh, I, I think the one thing we need to, the message we need to get out is masking is important, and also using the right mask uh, to really try to drive the numbers down. And this this is uh, this is not forever. I mean I think that. Uh, elsewhere in the country, we've started seeing a peaking of uh, the Omicron and, and it comes back down. I'd expect we will see that again, but just for the next uh, few weeks, I think we need to be particularly cautious just because it is so widespread. Yeah, let's and talk about just, for a quick second too. When, when we're talking about the peak, the peak of it, it depends on, you know, kind of who who's talking, what I'm seeing in other parts of the country or who the source is, but some People say, especially in the larger cities that have the waves come in and out first, that you know they do see light at the end of this variance tunnel. Um, some people say maybe not so much. But either way, you know, like we saw with Delta and then a lull and then uh, the current variant. What are y'all's thoughts on? Um, is this just going to be how we treat this in the foreseeable future in terms of peaks and valleys? Um, and when does when do you think? if you can tell on a crystal ball as much as we can, when, when do we start treating this as an endemic and not a pandemic? Yeah, well, you know, I think the key missing, uh, the key thing that's been missing up until now is therapeutics. Uh, 
So like with uh, influenza, if you catch the flu and you're diagnosed early enough, uh, then you could be given an antiviral drug uh, to shorten the duration of your illness. We now have that drug for, uh, for COVID, it's just not in high supply. And I'm speaking about the Pfizer drug Paxlovid, uh, which uh, reduces your risk of hospitalization and death by 88%, so long as you, are, uh, you take it within the first five days of the illness. But to use that effectively, we need prompt diagnosis. And this is where having uh, widespread availability of testing uh, becomes so critical. Uh, and uh, hopefully everybody has signed up on uh, covidtests.gov to get their uh, supply of uh, four uh, home test kits per household uh, so that you have the tools. If you get sick, you test yourself. If you're positive, you call your provider uh, to see if in fact you would qualify for one of these therapeutics. But I think that as we get this drug online and other drugs, which are less likely to interact with other medications that people may be on, then that's gonna be the major thing that's gonna be able to transition this to much more of an endemic uh, illness. Uh, up until now, we've had almost nothing that effectively treats COVID. And that's why we have so many uh, hospitalized patients who get seriously ill. So I'm actually uh, quite hopeful uh, that after this Omicron surge, as we ramp up testing, ramp up uh, Paxlovid and other agents come online, that there is a light at the end of the tunnel with regard to COVID. And Carla, you mentioned testing earlier too, and that's been a real challenge for people who are having symptoms or even just trying to do surveillance um, around it if they've had exposure. Um, Rapid tests are very, you know, hit or miss to come by in terms of the at-home tests. Um, PCR test results seem to be taking longer and more days to, to come back, which kind of, you know, makes it harder to control at the outset. So I'm just curious, what are you guys seeing from the county's end? Are there additional resources you see coming down for expanding the testing abilities? We are certainly staying in close contact with the, the state to determine uh, how many tests we can potentially order here. We have, we have tests on order. They haven't, haven't arrived yet. So we are working on that. I know we are working closely with the school system to um, there's a, the, and the state to help them get some testing available um, with some of their community partners uh, because the, you know we're really focused on the, our school age kids, right? And um, so as of January first of this year, we have had a total of 961 positives in New Hanover County Public Schools. Now that is students and staff. That's not just students. Um, of that 961. Uh, we had those positives and then we've had 193 exposures at school. So all those positives were not exposed at school. We've had 193 exposures at school and our total quarantine number since January 1st uh, with school system students and staff is 2,117. Yeah. Um, but like Dr. Kamitska was saying, I'll just go back to the, the mask wearing one of this, other than vaccination, one of the easiest things we can do to protect um, ourselves is to is to put the, put a mask on in indoor spaces and, and put the right mask on. And um, what we the message we've been trying to share all along is that when you put that mask on, you're not just protecting yourself from other people; you're potentially protecting other people from you. So it's a you know it's a win win. So that's why we want to continue to encourage masking, encourage vaccination, encourage boosters um, as some of our best tools in our toolkit tool right now. And then uh, finally, to, to wrap up on, because this question comes up a lot, I hear um, people who previously had um, COVID infections, Dr. Kmitz, I'm curious, you mentioned the, the patient mix that you're seeing in terms of unvaccinated um, uh, patients in the hospitals. How about patients in terms who have already had a previous infection under a different variant? Are you seeing uh, repeat patients come in or do they seem to have still some immunity to it? Uh, no, uh, we do see uh, patients with repeat infections. This is one of those infections where the uh, level of protection that you get from getting the infection is actually less than from vaccination. Uh, and uh, that's especially so if you, if you had COVID last year, uh, I think you should assume that uh, you have uh, you know, relatively little protection now. Uh, usually we think about three months worth of protection before it starts to wane. Uh, so anybody who gets COVID now, I still recommend getting vaccinated, uh, you know, uh, say a month after they recover. 
but certainly if your COVID episode was last year, you just need to be vaccinated. Uh, and uh, um, and the, the, the mRNA vaccines in particular, the Pfizer and the Moderna would be the ones that we would uh, uh, recommend. Okay, and as you can imagine, uh, Dr. Kometska and Carla are pretty busy right now with everything going on. So we're gonna let them uh, go and get back to uh, their role in responding really to the, the current surge in our community. So we wanna thank both of you for doing the spot uh, check-in with us. And I'm sure we'll be talking with both of you in the future on it as well. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye, Becky. Bye-bye. And then turning to our next discussion, we are going to kind of uh, piggyback off of what something Carla just mentioned. So uh, 2,700 students in New Hanover County School System having been quarantined since the beginning of the year. And just a reminder, the beginning of the year for traditional um, scheduled schools didn't start until January 6th. So we're talking two weeks here now on that level um, of, of families that are being affected. So it's very likely that you maybe have had um, a child come home either with symptoms or because of direct exposure. Um, or if not, if you don't have school age children at home or um, daycare age children at home, um, you like more than likely work with someone who does or um, are in companies that now has to figure out how to re-navigate this, which I feel like we all went through um, last year as well. So I'm a little bit biased as to bringing on this next topic and this next speaker, but I feel like it's something we probably didn't do as good a job talking about last year, um, particularly on the Woman Business Journal side, it, just in terms of, of how to cope uh, with this as working parents. Um, I will take the onus on that on me in that being a working parent and having children working from home, um, it's, a, it's a lot and it's a struggle and I'm not sure if we've all gotten better at it um, a year later. So I wanted to personally hear from um, freelance writer and author Audrey Goodson-Kingo, who is joining us. She formerly was editor-in-chief for workingmother.com. Um, they took a lot of those tips and things um, that they learned from interviews and turned it to a book called The Working Mother Ultimate Guide to Working from Home, um, something I freely scanned through all in the thick of it and trying to figure out uh, how to balance it. And I should point out a couple caveats here. Um, obviously, not everyone has the type of job or ability to work from home uh, when you have kids and preschoolers who can't be um, outside of the, the workplace. That's a that's almost a luxury of even being able to have that kind of flexibility. Um, and also we're saying mothers, but we wanted to stream this on the Business Journal Biz Talk as well because it clearly affects um, all parents and caregivers um, who now find themselves in the situation, either because of like what we we're talking about with the COVID impacts or in tomorrow's case, because of now an ice storm coming in and remote school, once again, um, making its return to the Cape Fear region, which I'm sure is to the delight of all teachers and parents uh, for tomorrow. But Audrey, thank you for joining us from New York. We appreciate it. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to start it off and say, what are some of the things that you have heard from parents since the beginning of the pandemic? You know, just, just an overall of, of what were the, the challenges and how have people been um, been approaching this? Yeah, it's it's been a challenging past couple of years. I think it's safe to say that. Thank you so much, first of all, Vicki, for having me on today. I really appreciate it. Um, I am in the thick of it as well with everyone else. I have a two-year-old and a six-year-old and they have this month been both in school and daycare at the same time, two days. So far, uh, we actually all got COVID ourselves recently. So we have been right there in the middle of it with everyone else right now. Um, and I think some of the words that I have used in the articles were catastrophe and disaster. <laughs> um, just because as every, you know, as everyone probably listening knows, you know, millions of moms had to leave the workforce um, to take care of kids, even the ones that didn't. Um, had to, you know, keep, like you said, keep working from home, which is a huge challenge to focus at the same degree that you were able to before when, you know, you have kids, you have to usher through virtual learning and, and toddlers, you got to keep entertained. Um, so, you know, even for those moms, you know, studies have shown that um, they were receiving, you know, fewer promotions as compared to working dads last year. So we kind of know all across the board for working moms, it's just been really challenging if you're a career committed mom to really maintain that level of um, progress that you might've seen in previous years because we have so many commitments on our plate right now. 
And, you know, unfortunately, this January feels a lot like uh, 2020. Uh, we're all having flashbacks. I just saw the uh, US Census Bureau, their pulse survey showed that parents with kids under five, 40% of them have had daycare or childcare disruptions this month. So we're just looking at nearly half of parents, you know, struggling to, to, to find childcare all over again. What, what do you think? Do you think we've gotten better at it in the past year? Um, do you think companies have gotten better at it in terms of handling these disruptions or is it just what it is and you got to, I don't know, figure out a way to cope? Or like you said, unfortunately, I mean, you're, you're right, the statistics have shown throughout the pandemic in terms of the impact it's had on uh, women in the workforce, particularly, um, but also playing into some of the, you know, the so-called Great Recession. I think people um, changing jobs because of that as well. So has it gotten any better, Audrey? <laughs> in some ways, I think it definitely has. I mean, we've seen remote work really catch on. Um, and I think a lot of companies now have switched to either a remote, a fully remote or to a hybrid model or to a remote when employees need it, at least model, um, just that flexibility, the idea that, Hey, we can do these, you know, a lot of jobs from home, I think has really caught on in a way that helps parents. Um, because even apart from the pandemic, there are days when you have emergencies and could really just work from home. You know, you got to take your kid to the pediatrician in the morning or what have you. So I think that's a big change. And I think, you know, speaking of the great resignation, I think one of the silver linings of that right now is we can kind of demand that from our employers. They know if they want to attract and retain uh, talented employees, you know, we sort of have, we're sort of in the driver's seat right now. Um, so I do think employees can ask for some of that flexibility in ways they couldn't before. And I think we've seen companies, particularly uh, the big companies, uh, particularly big tech companies, Adobe, uh, Facebook, Google, but even, you know, Bank of America, just a lot of the bigger corporations offering things like backup childcare and childcare subsidies and expanding their on-site daycare offerings. So I think in a way it's really opened up a lot of people's eyes to how big a burden caregiving is in this country. And I, and I think that's a, a silver lining and I hope that's something we continue to focus and improve on. <laughs> How about the day-to-day -day tips in terms of logistically having to do this? And that was one thing I thought was great in terms of reading the, um, the works and the articles you guys compiled into the book, you know, was kind of, um, was parents talking about how to actually survive during the day in terms of getting all of the work you need done, um, getting, you know, without having to do eight hours straight on an iPad. Although I will say this time around, um, you know, bless uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda and writing songs for Encanto because I think they have pretty much babysat um, our kids yeah. oh, yeah. sometimes this week. Um, so we didn't have that last round. So, you know, sometimes uh, some things are improving. But, you know, what would have been some of the, the tips that kind of resonated or at least helped people get through the day while still, uh, you know, maintaining some level of mental health in, in terms of doing that? Yeah, sure. I think some of my favorite tips that I've seen, um, I would try it as hard as you can to make the healthy snacks really accessible. So I saw a mom who put them in clear containers on the side of the fridge and the kids could literally open the fridge and pull out the carrot sticks and the grapes and the cheese. Um, so I really liked that. Um, you know, turning as much as you can of household materials into play items. You know, every box that comes in through that door is a play item, every toilet paper roll. Um, you know, making sensory boards out of shaving cream, you know, filling it in a plastic bag and shutting the plastic bag and letting them play in the shaving gel or cream. Um, I think just as much as you can turn your house into a canvas, because I think the toys by now, they've, they've seen them for two years. <laughs> they might be over some of those toys, but another great tip is hiding the toys. It's something we like to do, put them away for three months, six months, pull them back out. All of a sudden it's a new toy and new toys really, uh, provide hours of delight. Um, so those are some, I think, great non-screen tips, um, you know, and as much as you can for, for keeping kids occupied. Another great one, I think turning meetings into a chance to take a walk around the block. I just so highly recommend that. Um, if it's not one where you have to take notes or, or be leading the meeting, use it as a time to get some fresh air, to take the kids out, to take the dog on a walk. I just, I think that's so important for mental health is just to move and get sunshine as much as we can right now. That's great. I've done none of those things today. So I will start tomorrow. I will do all of those things. I promise. Um, 
But you know, you so you heard me ask earlier in terms of asking Dr. Kaminsky and Carlo in terms what are we what are we dealing with here long term? Is it just going to be um, peaks and valleys, up and downs? You know, in between each variant, are we going to continue to should, should we continue to can have this is the way of life? We're going to have uh, future closures again, and then you know learn how to just be people who can work from home with uh, with kids uh, also at home. Um, what do you see in terms of like just the long term impacts of how this has changed how we work. Yeah, I mean, I dearly hope this is not long term. Um, I should have, yes, I should have this advocate, uh, uh, the caveat. Um, this, I don't think I don't, the best case scenario here. Yeah, I don't think it's sustainable for working parents over the long term. I think we, I think it's just shown how important childcare is. I mean, we, we need our net, we need our village, uh, we need our parents and our grandparents and our friends and our aunties and everyone pitching in and helping in any way they can. So, um, I, I think on, again, I go back to, I do think it's really helped us, um, you know, at least make it clear to our employers how big a burden childcare is. And I do think it has changed the way we work um, in some ways and, and made work more flexible. And I think that's going to be really great. I do think one worry is, as of mine is, as employers switch to hybrid, a lot of companies are now doing, you know, part-time remote, part-time in office is that um, I think employers just need to be very careful to track the metrics of who's getting promoted because if it sets up a system where FaceTime employees are getting more time with upper management and getting more projects and staying more in the loop and therefore seeing more of the promotions and raises, it could set back the working parents who are choosing those remote options. So I just think it's that's something I really, I think, if you're a manager is something to keep an eye on um, just that if you've got some remote employees and some input, if you've got a mix of workers, just to make sure that everyone is getting, you know, fair and equal access to assignments and promotions is something I would, I would hope companies keep an eye on. Right. Thanks, Audrey. Good tips, both for parents. And then also, like you said, managers and leaders in the workplace too. So just to um, round us out, Again, we talked earlier about the, the health officials being in the thick of it. Audrey's also in the thick of it. And her and I uh, were both fortunate that we didn't have a toddler run through this Zoom, although I expect that at any minute too. So before that happens, um, I'm gonna let you get going back to there. But any resources that you know of or that you think would be good to point people to in terms of additional advice or you know, even uh, additional thoughts on this, whether it's online or uh, other media? Um, yeah, I think uh, New York Times parenting column, I think, has been doing a really good job of kind of capturing where we are right now. Um, that's one I definitely uh, take a look at a lot. Um, Parents Magazine, I think, has been doing a good job. I actually have a feature coming out next month on um, working mom's mental health and how we can help defeat burnout. So keep an eye out for that. Um, other than that, I actually would say, like you said, you know, this is not the time for parents to worry about screens. <laughs> I, I think give yourself all the grace in the world. I think any, sh you know, any show that is semi-educational, let them go to town on it for 20 hours. <laughs> My son's learned a lot from Octonauts. <laughs> It could be worse. <laughs> All right, Audrey, thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate it, that information and just kind of uh, reminding us of the big picture on this. And everyone who is watching or is listening later on our podcast, thank you for tuning in. Um, we are going to be including this video, obviously, in our um, afternoon news email from the Business Journal, like we always do for our weekly biz talk. We'll also be including it in a Wilma leadership email on Monday if you don't already received those, you can sign that, um, sign up for them at Wil wilmamag.com. You can find our previous Wilmington Biz topics on our wilmingtonbiztalk.com website or on your favorite podcast streaming platform. So thank you to everybody. And we will be checking in again with you next week. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Vicki.